Hello and welcome to CPH Session 19, Inferential Statistics, Making Comparisons and Conclusions from Data. This is Part H, Comparing Proportions Between Two or More Groups. In this section, we'll talk about when we can use a chi-squared test. Then, I'll show you the steps to go through to derive a p-value using Pearson's chi-squared test for independence or homogeneity. Then, finally, I'll show you what to do when your sample size is small. First though, we need to recognize that when we talk about chi-squared tests, we're talking about a family of statistical tests. They all use similar methodology and they all compute a chi-squared value, but they each serve a little different purpose. However, the most common chi-squared test is Pearson's chi-squared test for independence or Pearson's chi-squared test for homogeneity. Actually, these uh, two tests are identical on how they are executed and um, however, the depending on how we state our null hypothesis dictates whether we're testing for independence or homogeneity. And we'll spend part H talking about Pearson's chi-squared. So what do we use Pearson's chi-squared test for? Well, in the first case, when we're testing for homogeneity, what we're doing is comparing proportions among two or more groups using the same categorical variable. For example, perhaps I'm interested in whether or not the distribution of socioeconomic status is different among males and females. So I could categorize all people into one of five income quintiles. So that would be my categorical variable. And then I could compare the distribution of proportions uh, in males to that of in females. So those males and females would be my two groups, my two populations. On the other hand, when we're testing for independence, what we're doing is looking at whether or not two categorical variables are independent of each other within the same population. So for example, maybe I look at all Northeast Thai people as my population. Then I sample and use a questionnaire to ask what political party they belong to, like let's say red shirt or yellow shirt. And then I also ask their income level so I can classify them into uh, one of those five income quintiles. So in that case, I would be checking whether or not political affiliation is in independent from socioeconomic level. Now, <clears throat> you might notice that these two situations, homogeneity and independence, are pretty similar. And you would be right. The difference is really just a nuance of how we state our null hypothesis. Let me show you what I mean. If we consider the first survey comparing income levels between males and females, uh, I could have also said that male and female is just a second categorical variable and that my population uh, is all people. So I could check for whether income level and sex, those being my two categorical variables are independent. And so in that case, I'd be testing for independence. Uh, similarly, I could have said that red shirts and yellow shirts are two different populations, and I could check whether the distribution of income levels is similar between the two populations. And so then I'd be checking for testing for homogeneity. So ultimately, the decision of whether you're checking for homogeneity or independence comes back to what is your research question. Once you decide on that, then you can correctly frame your null hypothesis and choose the right test. So in testing for homogeneity, our null hypothesis would be that the distribution of counts within my categorical variables is the same among my populations. On the other hand, in testing for independence, our null hypothesis would be that the two categorical variables are independent from each other. Let's look at a simple example. I surveyed male employees and female employees and I asked them a simple question. Do you feel safe at work? Yes or no? In my survey, I surveyed 152 men and 149 women. The results showed that 73% of the men said that they feel safe at their workplace and 66% of the women said that they feel safe at their workplace. 
And I want to know, uh, is the distribution of safe and unsafe feeling workers homogenous between my two groups, my two populations of men and women? So I can use Pearson's chi-squared test for homogeneity. What I'm asking is, how likely is it to get the results that I got if the true proportion of secure feeling workers among males is equal to the true proportion of secure feeling workers among females? That is, is the distribution of those who feel safe at their workplace evenly distributed among males and females? And so the first thing I have to do is build a 2 by 2 contingency table. It's a 2 by 2 table because I had two groups, males and females, and I had two choices in my categorical variable, feeling safe or not feeling safe. I can tell you now that uh, you can expand your table to multiple groups and or multiple variable choices and still use the chi-squared test. So it's expandable to bigger comparisons. Um, then what we have to do is we have to populate our contingency table with the number of people in each of these classifications. So we would fill in where it says A, B, C, and D with the numbers of people and be sure to fill it in with with counts and not proportions. And so when we fill it in with our observations, we fill in the actual or observed table, which I have here on the left. Um, so if you remember, we said we had 149 females in the study, and 98 of them said they feel safe. Uh, 51 said they didn't feel safe. And so we have to have row and column totals, and, and that's what I show here with the capital letters A, B, C, and D. And we have the total numbers. We had 301 total participants in our study. With our observed table constructed, we can now build our expected table. The expected table is our model of what we would expect under our assumed conditions. So remember, our assumed conditions are our null hypothesis, which said that the distribution of safe and not safe feeling workers is equal among men and women. Uh, to do this, we multiply each row and column totals by the total and divide it by the total T. So in this cell, we've got the safe females and we can multiply its row total A by its column total C and then divide that product by the total T, and so on throughout all the cells in our expected table. When we do that, we get these values. So our model assumes that we would see 103.5 females that would say they felt safe at work if we assume that the distribution is equal among men and women. And so at this point, the chi-squared test goes on, what we would do is we would compare how different our actual observed values are from the expected model values. And we look at how different they are, and the bigger the difference, the less likely it is that our results came from the assumed model. And we can do that by hand, uh, but I'll save time and I'll show you how to do this in Excel and actually directly compute a p-value. Okay, so I'm here in Excel for Mac. Um, your Excel should look similar, uh, but there might be some small differences. Uh, what I've got here already is I've input my 2x2 two two contingency table uh, that we saw in the PowerPoint slides. We've got our, uh, the number of females that reported feeling safe, number of males feeling safe, and so on. So the first thing I need to do is get those uh, row and column totals that I showed you. So we can use the simply the uh, sum function, so I equal sign sum and then a parenthesis, and then I can just highlight those two, close my parenthesis, and uh, since I'm using the same thing here, and hit return, yeah, so that I can do that, I can copy and paste. Uh, so I'm using the controller open apple C, and uh, then pasting with V. Now over here, I can do the same thing, equal sign sum, and use my mouse to highlight those two. Close the parenthesis, hit return, and again, I can copy 
and paste all the way down. And what you can see here are my uh, row columns, 149 is the total number of females, 152 the number of males, 209 is the total number of people reporting safe, and 92 being the total number of not safe. Now if you remember, uh, we want to now do our expected. So we use the row totals times the column totals divided by the total. Now if I do my function correctly here, I can just copy and paste. Or I can do it one at a time. So the row times the column divided by the total. Now I can use dollar signs in here to fix my function as I copy and paste. So here, I don't want my column D to change, and here I don't want the row 5 to change, and here I don't want it to change at all. I want it to always divide by that total. Uh, if you're not sure <laughs> what I'm doing here, if this is new, uh, follow along with me now and uh, we can work on it together in the uh, analysis portion of the of the class. So this, my formula is done. I can hit return. Um, change the formatting there. I have one decimal point. And now if I've done this correctly, I can just copy and paste to each of my cells. And it looks like I've done that correctly. Um, so for example, because I use those dollar signs to fix, it's still at taking this column total times this row column, or this row total, divided by the total. And so now, in the gray is the observed table. Over here in the gray is the expected table. And I want to run a chi-squared test. To do that, I equal sign chi sq dot test is the function we'll use for the chi squared test and all that it needs is the actual range so here are my observed table and my expected range here that's it don't need to uh, include the row and column totals we only want to use the actual uh, values the two by two tables in this case close the parenthesis and I hit return and the value that's reported here is a p-value. So we don't get the chi-squared uh, value directly from this. Uh, we could calculate that by hand but what Excel will return to us using the chi-squared test function is the p-value. So here we get our p-value of 0 0.17. Okay, so interpreting our results we see that we would expect that we could see the results that we got, or something more extreme, 17% of the time under the conditions of our assumed null hypothesis. So assuming our significance level was 5%, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now remember, this doesn't necessarily confirm the null hypothesis. Perhaps our sample size was too small to detect the effect. Nevertheless, it's still fairly likely, that is 17%, that we could have seen the distribution of safety among males and females with our sample size, uh, or something even more extreme, if there really wasn't any difference between males and females. What happens, though, if our sample size is small? Well, first we have to define what is small. So if we're talking about a 2 by 2 contingency table, just like in my example, then our total number of participants is less than 20, then it's small. If our total is between 20 and 40, and the smallest expected, not observed, but expected value is less than 5, if any single one is less than 5, then it's small. If we're talking about a table that's bigger than 2 by 2, then it's small if more than one-fifth of our expected cells are less than 5. So in a 2 by 3 table, we have 6 expected cells. Um, we could have one of those cells uh, be less than five, but not two. Because if we had two out of those six, that would be more than the 20% of the cells. And so in that case, it would be small. And so what do we do if it's small? Well, we can't use the chi-squared test. 
being a parametric test, the underlying assumptions of uh, sample variance break down and it's not appropriate to use. So instead, we have to use an exact approach. And so we could use Fisher's exact test. I won't show you that procedure here, but this website has a nice tutorial. So at this point, you should be ready to finish question six, the last question on your inferential statistics practice worksheet. I do have one more part, part I, in which I go through a couple experiment situations and we decide which statistical test would be the appropriate to answer the research question. It's optional if you'd like to practice choosing statistical tests uh, just a little bit more.